Tis the season to upset the fanboys. Merry Christmas, everyone. Welcome to my top 10 games of 2013. I qualify it every time, yet the arguments always occur. It's a wonderful thing, actually. It's a great time of year. It's a time of year where people get to claim that you're wrong on the internet, which you'd think would be something very common, something that we're used to on a daily basis. And we are, absolutely. It's part of the job. But when you create a top 10 list, you are especially wrong. Especially wrong. This is particularly true if The Last of Us is missing from the list. Which, as it turns out, it is. As usual, the only, and I do mean the only reason that anything has made this list is simply because I enjoyed it the most. And that's as far as it goes. Why isn't GTA 5 on, you might ask? Because I didn't play it. Why would I? I'm waiting for the PC version. I want to see Rockstar's vision fully realized at 60 frames per second in a resolution not more suited to 2007. Why is The Last of Us not on the list, you might ask? Because I didn't enjoy the controls, so I didn't finish the game. It's really that simple. So feel free to commence the bickering. Tis the season for hate and misunderstanding. These are my top 10 games of 2013. Number 10. Killer Instinct. Welcome to the game that had no right to be any good. Developed by a company called Double Helix. This was the one game that I was looking forward to for about five seconds until I found out who was actually developing it. And this was the reaction of many people around the world as it was found out that no, it was not Rare that was developing Killer Instinct for its 2013 remake. Oh no, no, no! It was Double Helix, the developer behind such classics as G.I. Joe Rise of the Cobra, Silent Hill Homecoming, Battleship, and Green Lantern Rise of the Manhunters. This was a developer whose crowning glories were Front Mission Evolved, which was considered by many people to be a lesser sequel to the Front Mission series, and MX vs. ATV Reflex. That was it. And they gave one of the most venerated, although admittedly for a rather strange reason, fighting game franchises to these guys. For some reason, Killer Instinct has had a lot of nostalgia and an awful lot of weight put behind it. And no one really seems to know exactly why, especially considering the original game actually wasn't that great. However, Double Helix actually came through, and in a big way as well. Funnily enough, Double Helix actually consists of some of the members from one of my favorite studios, the now defunct Shiny Entertainment, who went out with a whimper after developing the atrocious Golden Compass and the embarrassing Enter the Matrix. This was a nosedive for a company that had developed classics like Earthworm Jim, MDK, Wild Nine, and Sacrifice. And along comes Killer Instinct, a budget title, a title that frankly was derided for many reasons, including its business model, by people that didn't understand just how fair that business model was. A $20 fighting game with next-gen graphics, a phenomenal soundtrack, and an amazing combo system that both has supreme depth and is very easy to access for a new player. Add on to that, the best, and I do mean the best, tutorial in any fighting game ever made to date, and you have the best launch title on the Xbox One and a stellar entry right back into the fighting game scene for Killer Instinct, a game that has, of course, long since been defunct. It is a triumph that came out of nowhere, as far as I'm concerned. It was a very pleasant surprise, and it actually makes you feel just a little bit warm and fuzzy that a company that was constantly derided and was given a bunch of shovelware to develop was finally given a passion project and given the support they needed to actually fully realize it. Incredible. It's a really fun game, and if you ever pick up an Xbox One, you would be pretty silly not to drop $20 on Killer Instinct. Number 9. The Wonderful 101. Yeah, that's two console games. It happens, folks. I do play games on consoles from time to time, and The Wonderful 101 is a very late entry to my 2013 Top 10. It's by one of my favorite developers who are about to enter the PC scene with their port of Metal Gear Rising. However, Wonderful 101 actually beat out Metal Gear Rising in this lineup, and that is for one reason, just how absolutely ridiculous and original this title is. 
This is a game that is absolutely overflowing with imagination. It takes a fairly played out genre that Platinum are admittedly masters in, the action spectacle fighter, and it turns it into this incredibly strange team battle whereby you draw shapes on your gamepad in order to create various weapons out of 100 tiny superheroes that can all morph together in order to create attacks. Not only that, but you can split off groups of the heroes in order to create multiple attacks in different areas of the screen, or just attack head-on with a large group of tiny, tiny superheroes. Add to that a fantastic art style, a completely over-the-top soundtrack involving a male chorus singing about how amazing these imaginary tiny superheroes are, and of course Platinum's trademark ridiculous writing, and what you're left with is a surprisingly good Wii U game that really stands out amongst the rather lackluster lineup of that particular platform as a truly original and truly hardcore experience. It is not without its flaws, I will certainly say that. Its tutorial does a fairly poor job of explaining what exactly is going on, and because Platinum are cruel and horrible human beings, they decided to put a timer on elements of that tutorial so you can actually fail it. Not only that, but enemies have a tendency of going off screen and the camera does not allow you to see incoming shots from time to time, making them very difficult to avoid. It is a game with plenty of quirks, it is a game with uh, plenty of minor issues, however, I would say that its originality and attempt to reinvigorate an otherwise rather samey genre, and indeed succeeding in doing just that, is what makes this game deserve a spot on my list. Number 8. Metro Last Light one of the most gorgeous technologically advanced games that we got this year found its way to us from Kiev in the Ukraine. Metro Last Light is the sequel to Metro 2033 that at the time was regarded fairly well, especially in terms of its graphical fidelity and the technology on display, but was lacking in terms of its gunplay and overall polish. However, the sequel did not disappoint. While it is fairly linear in many places and certainly is not perhaps the open world game that many were hoping for, it is a phenomenal first person shooter which is absolutely drowning in atmosphere, demonstrates some of the most advanced graphical technology we've seen in games up to this point including practically peerless lighting effects and delivers a very atmospheric and at some times scary post-apocalyptic experience. My complaints about the game focus on its overbearing linearity at times, including a rather annoying tendency to hold your hand and force you down a particular corridor, as well as its rather lackluster voice acting. However, if you're looking for an atmospheric experience that tests your PC to its limit, then you can't go wrong with Metro Last Light. Number 7. Path of Exile. This ended up being a little bit of a surprise to me, as did many of the games on this list, which is probably why they got there in the first place. This is a genre that I'm not really a huge fan of, and it takes a rather special game to get me to like it. Last year, Torchlight 2 was able to do that, coming in at number 10. This time around, we have the very Diablo-esque game, Path of Exile, a free-to-play title from a small New Zealand-based indie studio by the name of Grinding Gears. What struck me immediately about that game was the fact that they created a rather modern Diablo-esque aesthetic. For those who didn't like the changes to the aesthetic of Diablo 3, for instance, this game may very well be right up your alley. It uses that darker, pseudo-realistic, gritty look, which works very, very well considering the game is steeped in a moody and miserable atmosphere where it's made abundantly clear that this is not a nice place to be. The island is hostile to you and indeed all life, and everybody seems to merely be out to survive, and little more than that. Characters serve their own purposes and will happily help you as long as you are helping them, but at the end of the day they are certainly not your friends. The game itself utilizes fairly familiar mechanics with their own unique spin upon them. The combat system is instantly familiar to anyone that's played a Diablo game, however the intricate complexity of the massive passive skill system, as well as the idea of skill gems and the ability to link them to support gems which change their effects, gives players a wide variety of viable skills and builds to choose from. 
combat in general also feels very satisfying, although I'd imagine that's dependent on which class you play. My duelist with his two-handed bastard sword is able to destroy enemies in a wide variety of different and highly entertaining ways, including copious amounts of lightning, ice, and every now and again, the rather amusing infernal blow, which causes enemies to literally explode, damaging those around them. The game's frame rate is also rock solid, dealing with huge numbers of enemy creatures, sometimes 50 to 100 on the screen, without any real drops in frame rate, which seems to work rather well. Admittedly, the game's netcode does occasionally have some issues with desyncing. The hardcore experience is catered for alongside daily competitions which challenge players to a wide variety of different constraints in anywhere between one hour and several days long races in order to earn the most points. What should also be mentioned is the game's business model, which is pretty much the fairest free-to-play model you will find outside of Dota 2. And it's quite surprising that an indie company was actually able to subsist on this particular model. The only thing that these guys sell that is useful to you in-game is a selection of extra slots, including character slots, guild slots, and extra stash slots available in both premium and non-premium variants. Surprisingly though, the game is very generous on all of those fronts to begin with and you do not have to spend a penny, everything else going into cosmetic items such as pets and different skins for abilities as well as equipment. It is an incredibly fair model and I think as a direct result they have encouraged an awful lot of people to uh, buy microtransactions where they previously would not have. It's a really great action RPG that I would strongly recommend that you try. The sphere grid style system is certainly rather daunting to say the least, but I feel that if you deconstruct it and you have a look at it in a sensible way, then you'll be able to figure out exactly what you want to do. A phenomenal free-to-play action RPG coming from a rather unexpected place this year, which takes the spot at number 7. Number 6. Fire Emblem Awakening. The only handheld game that's going to make its way to my list this year, and what a damn good one it is. Every now and again I stumble across an absolutely fantastic handheld game, either on the PlayStation Vita or on the 3DS, and Fire Emblem this year is the best example of a hardcore handheld game that is a truly fully featured experience. Fire Emblem Awakening is the latest in a series of tactical RPGs or SRPGs, which of course were developed by Nintendo, going all the way back to the family computer, better known of course as the Famicom. It is one of the earliest examples of the genre and it made its name by featuring permadeath for its characters, something that very much continues into Fire Emblem Awakening. This is a game that is not only willing to tell you stories but also willing to let you miss out on them if you happen to allow a character to get killed. It has the effect of making you care about certain characters and want to preserve them, perhaps at the expense of their comrades, if at all necessary. It's a very challenging game with a great deal of depth and a fantastic lineup of characters and huge amounts of playability. It's a genre that I very much enjoy, and one that I initially got into with Shining Force 2 on the Sega Mega Drive, then of course into Shining Force 3, a game which I enjoyed an incredible amount, only to have Sega decide to stomp all over my right as a creator when I dared to show their 20-year-old video game. Regardless, Fire Emblem Awakening is a phenomenal title. The 3D rendered battle sequences look absolutely fantastic on the 3DS, which is of course rather surprising considering its limited power, and the more traditional aesthetic that is used on the battle maps also looks incredibly effective. It presents a fantastic soundtrack, a great storyline, and excellent full motion video cutscenes. It is a title that I would recommend to absolutely anyone that wants to spend a lot of time on their handheld. In a world filled with mobile games designed to be played on the toilet, this is a title that will keep you glued to your 3DS for hours at a time. I would go as far as to say that this is by far the best title that Nintendo has released the entire year. Number 5. Shadow Warrior. Now this is a damn good first person shooter and easily my favorite first person shooter of the year. It's brought to you by Flying Wild Hog, who were previously responsible for the development of Hard Reset, which was a decent first effort, though it seemed to miss the mark in its attempt to replicate the old style of FPS while bringing it 
bang up to date. Those guys were also part of the People Can Fly team, who developed games like Painkiller and the one and only Bulletstorm. And now along comes Shadow Warrior, which is a little bit more grown up for the studio perhaps, but still allows for some rather immature moments at just the right times. Shadow Warrior is a remake of the old 3D Realms game, and while it deviates hugely from the original, it does so in a way that is highly enjoyable. If I was to criticize the game, it would be due to the fact that its level design wasn't quite up to the original title, which featured very 90s-style maze-like levels, which I very much appreciate. However, you've got to give this game props for a fantastic and somewhat puerile sense of humor and a phenomenal combat system that is ridiculously enjoyable to play. What surprised me most about the game was its melee component was actually just as strong, arguably even stronger, than the first-person shooting component, which is unexpected considering the game's heritage. The katana has a wide variety of different moves and is really, really fun to use, slicing demon limbs in various different amusing ways, all accompanied by ridiculous one-liners. The wide variety of weapons is also stocked with upgrades, as well as secondary fire modes, and levels are chock full of secrets to discover. It's one of the most enjoyable FPS experiences I've had in the last few years, and it's really nice to see an FPS that was obviously designed with the PC in mind that has no desire to hold your hand whatsoever. It's the kind of game that you can get into and just obliterate hordes of enemies in while having an absolute whale of a time, and the developers and publisher have continued to support the game with free DLC as well as additional weapons. It is a really great experience. If anything, the only thing it's lacking is a multiplayer mode, but you know what? Every now and again it's nice to see a first person shooter that actually focuses on the single player experience, because these days, that's rather rare. Number 4 Dota 2 this is hard to argue with. The lineage of this title going all the way back to Aeon of Strife in the original StarCraft has spawned an entire genre of games in and of itself, including perhaps the most popular game in the world right now, League of Legends. However, I would be lying if I said that LoL was a game that I enjoyed more than Dota 2. It actually took me a while to come around to the idea of Dota. As a League of Legends player, I found the notion of things like denies to be unintuitive. I found the idea of not being able to go back to base anytime I wanted to be a waste of time, to be unnecessary clutter in a game that was too stuck in the past to really have any relevance. However, it's nice to be wrong, I have to say that. As I stuck with Dota 2, I saw what those mechanics actually added to the game. A great deal of depth, a higher skill ceiling, more complexity, more required teamwork, and a real emphasis on decisions actually making a difference and really mattering. That's not to say that other games of that genre don't, but I feel that Dota is the original in that respect. And it's done a great job of slowly introducing new players to the game itself without compromising its actual difficulty. And let's be honest, the learning curve on that game is a brick wall. Not just a brick wall, it's a cliff face covered in spikes and angry rock climbing monkeys ready to throw you off at a moment's notice. It is vicious. However, with a training mode and a coaching mode, the game has become a lot better for newer players. It's unfortunately a game that I'm not enjoying currently. I think I need to find a team, because honestly, queuing up on your own and going in with a bunch of random puppies is not a pleasant experience for the most part. It can become highly frustrating, and the game's lack of surrender button means that you can be locked in with people who just are not all that pleasant for sometimes an hour at a time. If you decide to bail on it, well, welcome to low priority queue, which is even worse. The queue times are also rather lengthy. The game certainly has an awful lot of problems, but I feel a lot of those are inherent to the genre. This is a game that has an absolute ton of potential when it comes to esports and competitive play. The International 3 this year was one of my favorite esports spectacles of the year, which is surprising because I'm usually a StarCraft guy, but I absolutely enjoyed that event and I thought it was really well produced. Valve did an excellent job with it, the teams played some phenomenal games, and to me, Dota 2 is still the best example of this particular genre. Will it be forever? Probably not, 
Considering how many games are being developed in this genre, sooner rather than later we may find a game that ends up being better. And to some people, that game already exists. It's called League of Legends. They believe that those mechanics and that particular design philosophy is a superior experience, and you can't really discount that because it's a valid opinion. However, personally, the game for me is Dota 2, and in 2014 I'm looking to hopefully get back into it with a few friends and see how far I can go. It's intimidating. Don't get me wrong, but I think now is the perfect time to give it a try. And you can find it, of course, for free over on Steam. Number 3. The Stanley Parable. You know, I was tempted to put this at number 8, but I don't think a lot of people would actually get the reference. This is the most enjoyable non-game that I've ever played. I've gotta say, it really walks the line between an actual video game and this idea of the virtual art installation, something that games like Gone Home and, to a greater degree, even Dear Esther very much inhabit. Gone Home is not on my list, but I can tell you for a fact that Stanley Parable very much is. It's an incredibly clever game. It pokes fun at everything. It pokes fun at the genre. It pokes fun at video games in general. And it pokes fun at the player for demanding that level of control and expecting there to be real consequences to everything they do. And strangely enough, the game actually provides you with those consequences, but they are perhaps not at all what you were expecting. This is a game almost purely about exploration, about observing your environment and uh, coming across ever more puzzling and perplexing ideas and situations, all accompanied by a fantastic narrator along the way, who delivers a fantastic dry performance and the script is funny enough to match it. It's hard to really describe to people that haven't played the game exactly what it is. All I can really say is, well, you're Stanley, or are you? No one is in your office. They all disappeared. Or did they? You gotta go and find out what exactly is going on. Or do you? It's a very unique experience that I would recommend to pretty much everybody. It may very well make you think about video games in a different way. Or it may just make you giggle. All of those are okay. It doesn't really have to achieve anything. In a year where the debate rages about games being art and many developers seem to be attempting to overreach and really say more than their video game is actually really qualified to, this is a game that simultaneously achieves that and yet mocks the very notion of doing so. A game with many endings that's going to mean different things to different people. And that means you should try it and find out exactly what it means to you. Number 2 Hearthstone. This really is the one game that I played the most for the channel. Everybody knows that I'm really into collectible card games, but Hearthstone came along and really, honestly, it swept me off my feet. And that was a little unexpected, but not completely. I feel like I was the only person in the world to be excited when the guys over at Blizzard announced a CCG. Obviously, that isn't the case, but there was a lot of skepticism which was, of course, closely followed by demands to get into the beta. That is a beta test that was surrounded by some of the most hysteria I've ever seen. There was desperation among people, demands to get into the early beta test. The Hearthstone subreddit was insufferable for months with people begging for keys, complaining about botched giveaways, and all manner of nonsense. For a game that so many people turned their nose up at when they initially heard about it, they were sure desperate to get in once they saw it in action. And Blizzard really did deliver. It's a very enjoyable experience with a surprising amount of depth, but also incorporates elements that really wouldn't work so well in a live card game environment with physical cards. It has some very interesting RNG mechanics. It does a very good job of demonstrating and presenting that stuff on the screen in a visually pleasing manner. It's a game that's simple to learn, but has layers and layers of depth beneath it. Does it have the breadth of Magic the Gathering? Well, of course not, but that's a game that's been around now for two decades. With a relatively fair business model in comparison to some other online card games, and an exceptionally compelling draft mode in the form of Arena, this is a game that has had me coming back time and time again, round after round after round after round, and I've invested more money, I think, in this game than any other free-to-play game in my life, simply because I've enjoyed it that much. 
I'm really looking forward to what the future brings for Hearthstone. Once it leaves its beta phase and once expansions start to drop and we see more features like proper observer mode, team games, PvE, and all manner of different things that we hope will be added to the game. It's a game that I still play every night simply for my own enjoyment, and there aren't all that many games that can really keep me playing for that long these days, especially when it becomes a game that I make videos of for my channel. It very quickly becomes a job, but Hearthstone never has. It probably will at some point. The magic will wear off, the luster will disappear, and perhaps I'll just get bored of Hearthstone's way of slinging spells and cards, but at this point, it's a game that I have a huge amount of fun with. Accessible to the newer player, but enjoyable for the highest level strategist as well. This game is absolutely oozing potential, and I really look forward to seeing what happens with it in 2014. And now, finally, we come to number one. A lot of you saw this coming. A hell of a lot of you saw this coming. You should have seen it coming. I stated in the video regarding this game that not only was this my favorite game of the year, that at the time I believed perhaps it was my favorite game of all time. Yes, dethroning the original Deus Ex. Now a lot of people said at the time, well, you're just saying that for views. You're saying that because it's controversial. You're making a grandiose statement that you don't really believe in. Or perhaps you'll just come to your senses. The impact of the game hadn't quite worn off on you yet, and you'd look at it through jaded eyes a few months down the line. Well, that didn't happen. Brothers A Tale of Two Sons is perhaps the best video game I have ever played. And that's a very tall order, isn't it? And so many people have asked me, how can that be possible? This is a two to three hour puzzle game. It really doesn't bear a second playthrough. It doesn't even have voice acting. How can this possibly be your favorite game of all time? Well, I explained it perhaps as well as I could have in the video, immediately concluding my full playthrough of the title. And I still believe those words to this day. This is a game that has connected me with characters on the screen in a way that no other game ever has. It's a game that uses the controls, not merely as an interface, not merely as a barrier to getting your characters to clumsily move around on the screen, but it actually uses it as part of the storytelling. And it's impossible to explain exactly why without spoiling some key points of the story that are absolutely mind-blowing and have a real emotional impact. Those are not words that I throw around lightly. I don't really get affected by games all that much in an emotional way. That's not who I am. I'm not a story-driven person. I like to focus on mechanics, and the mechanics of this game are somewhat innovative, but they're not really a massive paradigm shift. Yeah, it's pretty cool that you control one brother with each of the sticks, and the interaction between the two of them is key to your progress. It's described by some people as a one-person co-op game. But it's not about the mechanics in this case, it's about the way that this game told a story and what it represents for the future. Many games this year have tried to tell a story, and they've done so more often than not by hiring big name voice actors, big name script writers, by loading the game with cutscene after cutscene after cutscene, sinking millions of dollars into creating the most lifelike characters they could. And I applaud them for that. That's cool. I really like the fact that developers are dedicating themselves to making characters in games a little bit less one-dimensional. But I think most of them are missing the point. The true strength of video game narrative comes in the interactivity of this particular medium. This is something that no other medium can do. No book, no television show, or movie will provide that level of interactivity, not even close. And that is the way that you really convey your narrative, because the player should not be on the outside looking in. The player should feel like they're a true part of this story. Lengthy cutscenes and celebrity voice actors make me feel like I'm watching a movie, not playing a game. That's not my voice that's coming out of these characters. I'm not really controlling these characters. They're going on for perhaps sometimes 10 minutes plus at a time without any input from me as the player whatsoever. I feel disconnected from these characters, and while the animation and the voice acting and the script writing is extremely impressive, a game like Brothers says, you are part of this story, you are these two brothers, and we're going to connect you to them in every way possible, and we're going to allow the story to connect with you directly as a player, and their control method is really what allows them to do that. 
It helps, of course, that the game isn't entirely laden with cutscenes and that it likes to be interactive wherever possible, keeping its non-interactive elements to a minimum. But inherently, this game is the story of two boys struggling to save their father, and that's a struggle that you really feel a part of. It sounds a little cliche, doesn't it? And you might be thinking, well, don't other games do that as well? The idea of hanging on with your controller to make sure that you do not fall down a sheer cliff face or let go of your brother. This is the kind of thing that other games do. Yes, you're right, but none of them does it this well. And there's one particular moment that accents absolutely everything that I'm saying. And anyone that's played this game knows exactly which moment I'm talking about. The controls are not merely there as a means to an end. They are there to connect you with the characters on the screen, the story, and the journey. The writer of this game, as well as the developer Starbreeze, seem to understand that games can be something more than merely running cutscenes. They can be something more than CG television shows with occasional interactivity. They can be more than that, and they can really play to the strengths of the technology and the medium that we have at our disposal. Brothers to Me is the single biggest example of just that. If you break it down and if you decide to be cynical, as much as I tend to be, then you can look at it and say, well, this is merely nothing more than a third-person puzzle platformer with some fairly simple puzzles involving controlling two characters at once, and while that's a rather nice gimmick, that doesn't make it a game of the year. And you'd be right if that's what you wanted to deconstruct it to, but I really feel that Brothers is far more than the sum of its parts, and what Brothers represents, and what Brothers made me feel in the two and a half hours it took me to actually beat that game, gives me a great deal of hope for the potential of video games going into 2014 and beyond, in a murky year of questionable business decisions. This is a simple game trying to tell a simple story in the best way it knows how to do. And in my humble opinion, it succeeded absolutely in doing just that. Brothers, A Tale of Two Sons, ladies and gentlemen, is my game of the year for 2013. It's been a pretty good year for the channel, folks. This time last year, we were hovering just short of 900,000 subscribers and at this time this year, we're about to break one and a half million. I'd like to thank each and every one of you for your support throughout 2013, and I hope to see you again next year. You seem to like it here, so I'm going to continue doing what I do best and hope that's good enough for you. Please have a safe and very happy Christmas, and I'll see you next time.